they're a good match for solar energy and wind power. Using renewable energy produces a very clean hydrogen cycle, but in addition, the amount of energy available from renewable resources is vast. Our long-term goal is to produce hydrogen using renewable energy resources, such as solar, wind, and biomass. Since 1980, we have consumed far more oil than we have discovered. We're now finding only one barrel of new oil for every four barrels that we use. The lion's share that remains is still locked underground, controlled by a handful of countries in the Middle East. The oil-consuming nations of the world that rely on these reserves are highly vulnerable to the political instabilities of the region and the goodwill of its leaders. It's this single source dependency that takes away our freedom. Right now, the United States is tied, essentially, to Arab oil imports. With hydrogen as a currency instead of gasoline, for the first time in man's history, we're allowed to use any primary source. Hydrogen offers a significant uh, advantage there in dealing with uh, energy security because you can get it all the way from renewable sources using the sun and water and wind, uh, geothermal uh, or hydro, or even nuclear for the, for the electricity. Um, but you can also get it from all the, all the hydrocarbon fuels. What this does is it gives us options to use different domestic fuels that can insulate us from price shocks, supply disruptions, and, and other threats to our, our national and economic security. Whether it's fusion, a hydrogen economy, or ideas that we've not yet explored, I think that we need to leapfrog the status quo and prepare for a revolution in how we produce, deliver, and use energy. Today, more than 750 million vehicles are in use worldwide. And that number is likely to double over the next 20 years. As the world's population continues to increase, the demand for energy is expected to rise by at least 50% over the next two decades. Air pollution and toxic spills are obvious impacts of our dependence on fossil fuels. But experts increasingly point to climate change as the most serious consequence of their use. Dr. Rajend Pachari is chairman of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. What's happened is since the Industrial Revolution began, we've been burning more and more fossil fuels. This has increased the, the concentration of these gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Many scientists believe that the Earth's temperature could rise by as much as 5 degrees Celsius in the next 100 years. These temperature increases would cause a rise in sea level and drastically alter local climate conditions. What you would see are some extreme events. The fact is that the sea levels are rising throughout the planet. This poses an enormous threat to the coastal areas of a large number of countries. Rising temperatures would affect many types of ecosystem, crops, and human health. The impact of rising temperatures regionally has already been identified in one of the planet's coldest ecosystems. The time on the ice getting shorter and the hot days getting warmer the beautiful time of the blizzard. I don't think I have experienced a good, beautiful blizzard 
I didn't land in a long, long time now. Now we have big storms instead, not blizzard. We've been noticing over the last few years that the uh, ice, sea ice is melting much sooner. Rivers are flowing more because, remember, rivers are fed by the melting ice and melting snow. And now the melting permafrost. You can't fish uh, uh, unless you have the sea ice. And uh, when it breaks up earlier, you can't get to the fish uh, by boat because it's too dangerous. Despite a pattern of warming and cooling over the last 100 years, much of the planet has now warmed. Scientists still have much to learn about the effects of increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases, but generally agree that such increases accelerate the rate of climate change. Uh, fortunately, the technology has now developed at the same time we need it uh, so that we can get out of the business of digging up carbon and burning it and blowing it out the tailpipe and smokestack. <laughs> Hydrogen? That stuff's dangerous, isn't it? We do have the perception uh, of safety being an issue with anything that we fuel our vehicles with. Gasoline tanks do explode. Uh, we do have issues with any energy resource, and hydrogen is an energy resource. It's going to be packaged in one way or another on a vehicle, and it's going to present safety issues that are going to need to be dealt with. We've got many safety features on our station. We have hydrogen sensors that sense for any hydrogen leaks. Uh, we have a computer system that monitors all systems to ensure that there's no problems. And we have a flame detector that watches the vehicle's refueling station at all times. We're working on an international basis to develop common protocols, codes, and standards uh, to ensure safe handling, and, and to assure interoperability of all of these systems that we want to work in the, in the hydrogen future. A study by the Ford Motor Company has shown that with good engineering, a hydrogen-fueled vehicle should be just as safe as a gasoline vehicle. We don't think that the safety issues with hydrogen are any greater than any other uh, energy form like gasoline, oil, or uh, natural gas. And indeed, it has some characteristics that in the long run may, may give it some safety advantages. Hydrogen is a highly versatile energy carrier. Like any other fuel, it can be burned, powering anything from a rocket, like NASA's space shuttle, to an internal combustion engine. BMW and Ford have already developed conventional cars that run on hydrogen. You can burn hydrogen in an engine, similar to what we do today with gasoline or natural gas, but you can also use it in a device called a fuel cell. One common fuel cell is called a PEM, or a proton exchange membrane fuel cell. In a PEM fuel cell, as hydrogen tries to bond with oxygen, it is drawn towards the air on the opposite side of the membrane. However, the membrane only allows the protons to pass through, forcing the electrons to take the longer route. This movement of electrons is what we call electricity. On the other side of the membrane, the hydrogen merges with oxygen, producing H2O, or water, and it is clean enough to drink. Fuel cells produce electricity very efficiently, and they can easily be used to power cars or trucks, or even buildings or ships. One of the great virtues of uh, hydrogen fuel cells is that they scale almost infinitely to different sizes, everything from uh, hearing aid batteries to portable fuel cells for your cell phone or computer. It's possible in the not too distant future that as a consumer you will be able to buy and install a cartridge of hydrogen on your cell phone or your portable laptop computer uh, and provide power to that device for 40 days. At the other end of the spectrum, fuel cells are being installed to power entire office buildings, completely 